Grace and mercy to God's people, through Jesus Christ, the head of the church. Amen. Well, today is our second week in stewardship, looking at that theme. And last week we looked at how God encourages us in our work not to grow weak, not to grow weary, not to faint, not to lose heart, but to endure in our work until the end, to the harvest, to the finish line that we might reap. And today I'd like to look with you at another theme on stewardship, namely, what is your work? What has God called you to do? What is your role? Uh, But where do I fit in to the work of the kingdom, pastor? And is my work important? Is it as important as the preacher's job in the kingdom? Well, let's talk about this today in the scripture, see what God would teach us by his holy word about your work, your role, where you fit into the work of God in the kingdom, in the church. Well, first of all, God says to us, Remember, my children, remember that my church on earth is not a one-man show. It's made up of many people. And you are one of those many people whom I've called out of the world to be my own, to be my church, to be fellow workers in the kingdom. And each of you has an important role to play. Do you believe that? Do you uh, hear that as the word from your king? Well, where is it written in the Bible that backs that up? Well, let's take a look here, that the church is not a one-man show, but made up of many. We read in 1 Peter chapter 2, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, that you may declare the wonderful deeds of him who calls you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What are you, a one-man show? It says here you are a people, a nation, a priesthood. You're a team, aren't you? How about here in Revelation chapter 7? John says, I looked, and behold, there was a great multitude whom no man could number, from every tribe and tongue and nation, uh, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes. And they said, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits upon the throne unto the Lamb. So, not one, but many. Thank you. One more here. This is a beautiful picture of the church in Romans chapter 12. Paul says in, uh, let's see, that's verse 4. It says, For as in one body we have many members, you know, hand, feet, eyes, ears, etc. And all the members don't have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ. And we're individually members one of another. Some are feet, some are hands, some are this or that. And so the church of God on earth is made up of many. It's not a one-man show, but it's made up of all of us. And we all share in that work. And so here I thought it would be refreshing for us for a few minutes to just blow out of the water a popular misconception conception that's out there in the world about the church. Namely, that the pastors are the chief people of the church and that we do most of the work. Now, I know that you don't think that. I hope you don't think that. But in case you do, let's just take a moment to blow that out of the water. Now, our pastor is important. Sure, preachers are. Hear what we say in Romans chapter 12, what Paul says. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are men to call upon him him whom they've not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without a preacher? Right? Right? And so, do the preachers have an important role in the church? Yes. Sure. We're to preach the word of God, to tend the flock, to feed them with the word, to lead, to shepherd, and to reach out to unbelievers, right? To bring them into the faith, to be saved. So what are pastors like on this Thanksgiving weekend? Sort of like the quarterbacks, (laughs) right? We are a leader in the church, in the congregation. Uh, We're to inspire, we're to encourage, we're to call plays. We're to to read the playbook, right? We're to interpret it, understand it, be able to share that with the rest of the congregation, the rest of the team, so we all work together to cross the finish line together. But does that mean that the that the job of the church is accomplished by the quarterback? No. Where would the quarterback be if it were not for the right and left guards? Right? He'd be missed. He'd be on the ground. He'd be crushed. 
He'd be blasted to smithereens. He would be a loser. He wouldn't score. Where would he be without the, uh, without the receivers? Or, or the running back to carry the ball? He would not win, right? And so in the same way, God has arranged it in the church that there are quarterbacks, but each of us has a different position. And we are all to use all of our positions in order to get this ball across the finish line that is the gospel, holding it fast, not letting anyone steal it, and cross the finish line, saving soul, bringing people, and enduring to the end, and attaining that trophy, that crown, that wreath, that imperishable wreath, that's promised to those who love Him. Right? Amen? Are we Amen. together? Yes. All right. <clears throat> what do we read here in 1 Corinthians 12? Let's read here a little bit about all of our different roles. It says, uh, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of working, but it's the same God who inspires them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. In other words, to advance the ball of the kingdom across the world and to hold it fast to ourselves, we all have various different gifts, but they all come from the same Spirit. <coughs> and we're all to use them together. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To the other, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of, the, of tongues. All of these are inspired by one of the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So who is the owner of this team? God. Who's the chief quarterback? Jesus Christ. Right? Each congregation you can look at as, as a, 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 a team in itself as well. In the great team. With its own quarterbacks. Right? But each and every one of us has gifts. And we all need to use those gifts together to advance the ball. To score. To win the final victory. Jesus himself leading us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Alright. So... To show this just more clearly, one more time, and conclusively, that the church is not a one-man show up here. <laughs> Look at Jesus. He is the great quarterback, right? He could score everything all on his own, correct? He could defend himself. He could advance himself. He could do everything. Look at how he handled money, for example. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 17 and see what our Lord can do. Okay. When the time when they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the half shekel tax went up to Peter and said, "Doesn't your teacher pay the tax?" "Yes," says Peter. When he came to Jesus, Jesus spoke first, saying, "What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth exact their tribute? From the sons or from others?" And when he said, "From others," Jesus said, "Then the sons are free." However, so as not to give offense to them, go to the sea, cast a hook, and take the first fish that comes up. When you open his mouth, you'll find the shekel. Take, take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. Now, wouldn't you all love to pay taxes like that? <laughs> uh, we'll go fishing, and the money will be there miraculously, in the mouth of the fish. Could Jesus have done that every time he needed any money? Sure. Absolutely. Right? He can do anything. He's God. God the Son. The Son of God. But we notice what, he said, what happened. How did Jesus finance his ministry? He involved others in the play didn't he? Of his own choice. Look at what it says in Luke 8. The twelve were with Jesus, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, Joanna, uh, Susanna, who provided for them out of their means. So how did Jesus have money? He involved others in the team. The women actually were the ones who supported him with money so he could do what he needed to do to get that ball across the finish line together. Right? Do you see how God does that all the time? Like how Jesus uh, dealt with food. Did he need to have uh, food brought to him? Well, he could command the stones to become bread. He goes out to the wilderness, feeds 5,000 people with a couple loaves of bread and a couple fish. Or um, uh, he could have just spoken the food into existence. Or even not you needed it. But look what, he goes to the house of Mary and Martha and receives Martha's cooking. Right? 
And then he goes to Zacchaeus and says, Zacchaeus, come down from that tree, for I must stay at your house today. He took his shelter. He involved these guys in the team for their gifts to use them. And one more. How about preaching and preachers? Could Jesus do it all himself? Absolutely. He could preach to the whole world all by himself and probably a whole lot better than I can do it. Although he's in me. Right? right. But guess what? Jesus involved, he sent out the 70 to do the preaching, to do his work, to involve them on the team. And then after his resurrection, he sent out the 12. And they evangelized the whole world. Jesus himself, his spirit being in them. But look, I want you to get here that the church is not a one-man show. Don't look up here and think that I'm, I do all the work. I have an important role as quarterback, but we got all, all of us work together. And Jesus himself shows that by his own ministry, his own choice. Because that's God's design. He creates the church to be a, made up of many people, all on a team. Defensive ends, tight ends, split ends. <laughs> okay, there's no split ends, but like that. But everybody's got their own role to play in order to, to advance that ball of the gospel. And so, I want to ask today, are you contributing? And are you giving it your all with the gifts and abilities that God's given to you for the kingdom, for the team, for the victory? So think about that in stewardship. But the next question you might have is, but what is my role? How do I find it? What's my work? What position do I play on the team? And how do I find it? Discover it. So I can play my all and help. Well, first of all, I'll say to you this. If you are uh, not sure what your role is, I'll start out by saying it can be difficult to discern and find out what that is. Have you guys experienced that? I know I did. I wish it were all for us. <laughs> no, maybe not. But like Paul in Acts chapter 9. Listen to Paul's call. Paul's call. It says uh, in verse 3 and following, Now as Paul journeyed to Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed about him. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. And he went into the city, and as Paul tells later, he says, Jesus says, Depart, for I send you far away to the, to the Gentiles. So, wouldn't that be cool? If you're wondering what your job in the kingdom is, and, and just a, the sky is split, and a light flashes on the road to a city, and says, here's what you're to do. Straight, plain words of English. Or Greek, or Aramaic, or whatever. I wish it were like that, in a sense, and make it a whole lot clear. Sometimes it's not so clear for us. Remember, God told Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And to Moses, he said, come, I'll send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my forth my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But I want to tell you something, friends, if you're wondering today about your role, just because you don't have a flash of lightning, or a clap of thunder, or a heavenly stellar vision telling you in plain English words what to do, guess what? God is going to lead you straight and sure, nevertheless, just as he led them into your work, into your position. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. <laughs> You know how I know that? Because Proverbs says, A man's mind plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. The Lord directs your steps. Also, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. God has already prepared your position. How then are you to find your work? Well, if you don't have a flash of lightning, or a thunderous voice from a cloud, I simply say to you this, ask to yourself, what are my gifts? What am I especially endowed to do? What abilities has God given to me? For He gives you abilities according to what role He has for you on the team. And what is in your heart to achieve for the Lord? We all have different things in our hearts. Listen to what it says here. Romans 12. For as in the body we have many members, and all the members don't have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ. Individually members one of another having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let's use them. Say that. Use them. Use them. Thank you. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if uh, service in our serving, he who teaches in his teaching, he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who contributes in liberality, he gives aid with zeal, he who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. What do we learn about our gifts based on those verses? 
You know, sometimes you might think, I want to be the quarterback. Maybe you should be. Who knows? Um, other times you might think, but I don't have any great gifts. What about healing? That'd be cool. Prophecy, yeah, right on. Preaching, I understand that. Or, or something miraculous, working of miracles, awesome. But then notice the other gifts that are given here. Some are contributing in liberality, out of your treasures, cheerful givers, giving aid with zeal, doing acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Are those things gifts too, to be used in the kingdom? Physicians on the team, they might not be so fancy, like, with lots of flair, but they are gifts too. And I'll tell you what, there's a gift in here called exhortation. Encouragement. Can you encourage somebody else? You know that Barnabas in the Bible was surnamed by the apostles Barnabas. His name was Joseph. It means son of encouragement. That is a spiritual gift to encourage other people. And I'll tell you something. If I had a choice between a worker of miracles and an encourager, I'd take an encourager every day. Maybe, maybe on, your, on the team you could be called the encourager. Watch out, the encourager. <laughs> right? Watch out, Satan, you'll not get this guy down. Right? Or doing acts of mercy, doing that with cheerfulness. Here's the cheerful giver. Watch out. Or the contributor. Wow, the contributor. <laughs> Something like that, you know? These are fantastic gifts that God's given. What is your gift? What are you especially endowed to do? And what's on your heart? For all these in spirit are inspired by one and the same spirit. Portions to each one individually, as he wills. If you have good hands in football, you might be the center, right? Because he's got his hands on the ball in every play. You might be a, a quarterback, but maybe if you're big, you might be a guard. Maybe if you're quick, a receiver, or a cornerback. You know, cornerback. We're not all the same gifted. We all have different gifts. We're to use those gifts on the team for what God has specifically gifted you to do. And one thing you can also do, not only looking at your gifts, but also look at your heart. Now, we know that the heart is deceitful, and as Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 17, etc. But guess what? God also works with our hearts. He places things on your hearts, desires. What, I'm going to ask you, what are you desirous to do? Where is there a need that you see that you're excited to fulfill? Maybe God is calling you to that and someone else to something else that they're excited about and you're not so excited about. Because He put that on your heart to search, to search after, to go after. Perhaps that's God's leading. And perhaps it's not so glamorous as quarterback or something, limelight type of guy. But guess what? In the Bible, we have Zenos was a lawyer. Gaius was a host, a refresher of the saints. Luke was a doctor. Uh, the widow was a cheerful giver, gave two mites. Hannah was a mother. Asaph was a musician. You don't have to leave your present job to serve God or to, quote, enter the ministry full time. You ever hear that? That really gets my goat. <laughs> I'm going to enter the ministry full time by being a pastor. Guess what? You're all in the ministry full time. No matter what your job is. You're on the team, man. Play. Contribute. Whatever you, wherever you are. Each person has an equal role of importance to get that job across the, that ball across the finish line. Now I want to tell you, it's a difficult process for me finding out that I should be a pastor or a quarterback in this case. It was difficult. I wrestled for years. Pastor, captain, pastor, captain. And it was kind of a toss-up. I'll tell you, I had no flash of lightning. Uh, the skies didn't part, and a thunderous voice said, You shall be a pastor. No. I didn't have a stellar vision. But you know what I did? I weighed over time, just by the wisdom God gave me. I say, I see that there's a game on. There's a great fight occurring. People are in need. What are my gifts? Where can I best use them? I thought I could be a captain. <clears throat> the wind chambers, I was already sailing those. I enjoy them. Felt like I fit like a glove. <clears throat> but then I thought I could also be a pastor. I said, there's a great need for pastors. I said, I can speak well, I think. I have a zeal that people know Jesus Christ. I want them to know the truth. I don't think I'll be afraid to share it. I also think I can visit people. I can baptize. I can do the, the visiting. I can do the sacraments. Maybe I can use my gifts there. And I weighed these and I thought... You know, I could serve as a captain. That would be holy and royal too. But my opportunities would be greater as a pastor. So I chose pastor. Now, you can do any job in the kingdom. 
lawyers, doctors, uh, whatever. You know, you can't be the mafia and serve the Lord like, no, you can't do that. But if you're a mother, come on, that's a great job. Do it with zeal. And when I was choosing to be a, uh, I chose to be a pastor, and I remember the first year I, I went and I was visiting in the hospitals, and I compared that summer to my previous summer of sailing windjammers and captaining up in Maine. And I thought, and I said to my dad at dinner one night, I said, you know, last summer on captaining was maybe more fun. But what I did this summer, I believed in more. And I chose from that moment on to live my life not so much on what I enjoyed the most, but what I believed in the most. And I'll tell you, that's made all the difference. And I also enjoy what I do as a pastor. But it, wasn't, it was a choice of what I believe in the most. And as I just did two things, kept my eyes on Jesus and sought to follow love, God led me into what he wanted me to do. And it's the same thing for you. Keep your eyes on Jesus, follow love, and God will lead you into your work with your abilities. And I gave up the seat. And that was hard. And I was depressed. I wouldn't let myself even draw ships at seminary. But it was so painful. And I thought, but I'm giving it up for the Lord. But then I found God said, Greg, I've got a talent for that too. A place for you for that talent too. I think I'll send you to Florida. To the most seagoing church in the LCMS. We've got Navy men and Coast Guards, Coasties, Coast Guards men. People will love the sea. And I'll give you a part-time sailing charter boat on the side where you can do your witnessing to people along life's journey. And I'll tell you, I've witnessed to hundreds of people on that boat more than I've witnessed anywhere else in Florida by far. God doesn't give you gifts and talents and experiences and their heart's desires in life for you to just be frustrated. He gives them to you to use them. What's on your heart today? Where is there a burning desire to serve the Lord? What gift might you have? And where is there a need that those gifts might fulfill. It's not going to be the same. So what part of the church are you, I ask? What is your work? It's all important. And here I'm going to give you a warning. Don't compare yourself with other people. Pastors sometimes do that. Oh, this person is better than I am, or his church is bigger than I am. But Christians do that. Don't compare yourself to another person's gifts. He has his position, you have yours. Quarterback, cornerback, tight end, running back. Receivers, they're all different. But each has his own special place, each his own special glory. Paul says we're all one body in Jesus. One's a foot, and the foot shouldn't say that the hand or the eye or the ears, etc. I have no need of you. We're all one. We're all on the same team. Nobody looks down on each other in the kingdom. We look up to each other. And as equals, we look to each other. Amen? Amen. Every role is vital. Everyone's essential. When Paul once, uh, I think Pastor Menneke preached on, on the church being the body of Christ. I remember Twyla Horn told me, who many of you know, I attended for years and years, charter member. She said, when she was thinking about the body, she said, I think, I think I'm the liver. <laughs> the liver? You're the liver? Yeah, she said, I'm the liver. Because I'm quiet. Nobody really notices me so much, but I just quietly cleanse the whole church through prayer. Mm. Oh. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Yeah. What is your position? You know, I lost, I, I took out a little bursa sack from my knee one time. The doctor said, you don't need it. You know what I found out every time I've run for the decades following that? I needed that sack. I can feel it every day that it's not there. The church is, is going to be missing if you're not doing your part, whatever, as small as you may think it is. If on the football team, no one's going to bring water. To the, guy, to the receiver who just ran and gave him oxygen, that guy's done. You know, we all have jobs, be they unglamorous, be they unseen, be they unglorious. Nevertheless, they are glorious in God's sight and essential. Where would the church be if not for you? Now, if I'm the quarterback and I'm up here preaching, I'm trying to pass the ball, right? But then guess what? I'm done on Sunday. I go on to the next thing. Here, Bill. I pass the ball. He passes it over to Art. All right? Guess what Art does with my sermon? I didn't throw it to him because the camera's there, all right? <laughs> Art takes the sermon. He's the receiver. Then he goes out and shares it with thousands. On the radio, by putting it on the radio, on the internet, by putting it on the internet, and whatever else, or just by speaking it. You all do the scene. How would this word get out if you guys didn't support it financially? Right? 
Art and I don't have the money to support the radio show. You guys do. How would we run across the field if the grass was not mowed? If someone comes to the church and it's dilapidated and falling down, visitors would flee. Thanks be to God for the trustees. Our vacation Bible school. Children's festivals. We'd never get them done if everybody didn't participate. Who participates? Feeding the poor. Some people pack the bags. Some people distribute them. How do we do it if Dennis or someone else didn't drive down to Melbourne to pick up that food? And singers. We got the band, right? The chorus, who is giving us a good heart. Dan and Ginger, and our hearts to sing as we go along life's way to cheer us. Beth, look at the creative work she did on the bulletin with all of your pictures and that jigsaw puzzle and all of her other creativity. We have hearty prayer warriors. Some people I know here are unsung, unseen, but I watch them doing unseen, inconspicuous acts of mercy all over the place. But they never ask for any glory from it. But boy, are they contributing to the king and to the kingdom and to the team. Some counsel with wisdom. And every task, I don't want to tell you, whether it's large, ours, or small, is important to our God. It's important to the king. It's important to me to get that ball across the finish line, to score, to be the winners. And that the enemy, who is on the other side, the devil, does not succeed. But we crush him. And guess what? We have Jesus Christ, who's the chief quarterback, the all-time MVP of all leagues. And he says, I will always, friends, lead you in triumph, from one degree of glory to another. From triumph unto triumph, from victory unto victory, just follow me. We have the best quarterback of all, and that's him. These are his promises to us. Therefore, as each has received a gift, employ it for one another, as good stewards of God's very grace, says Peter. That in the end, we may all cross that finish line, that goal line together, rejoice, rejoice, and leap for joy. And finally, we're all different. We all have individual fingerprints. We all have different faces as they look at us. You call me on the phone, I know who it is before you mention your name, because I know your voice. We have different experiences, different pasts, different financial this or that, different talents. But I'll tell you what, at the same time, we're all the same. Because we're all on the same team. And we're all human. We've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. We've all sinned. And we're all justified freely by God's grace as a gift through Jesus Christ who has crossed the finish line for us and scored. Because by His cross all of our sins have been forgiven. He's won eternal life. He gives it as a gift. And we've all believed in Him. Amen? Amen. We be we've been saved in Him. We've been baptized in Him. There is one Father, one God, one baptism, one Lord, one faith, one destiny for us all. One team. And we're to build each other up with love and encouragement and refreshment and say, good job, let's go. Come on, we can do it. Because that's what our Lord Jesus Christ does for us. And I'll tell you, you're a chosen race according to God. A royal priesthood. A holy nation, God's own people. That you may take that ball of the gospel. Declare the wonderful deeds of him who calls you out of darkness. And it was marvelous light. With one destiny. So we're all going to bear the heat of the day together. Amen? Amen. All have sweat on our brow together. Amen. All go through the hardships of training and practice together. All encourage each other. And all use each and every one of our individual gifts. Wherever you are on the team. You are as important as I am. If any one of you doesn't do your gift, we won't succeed. But if each and every one of us contributes with all our heart, we will cross that finish line. In fact, Jesus guarantees it. And he tells us... This is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he's given me but raise it up at the last day. MVP quarterback says, I will get you across that finish line. When death comes to get you, I will raise you up. For this is the will of my Father that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I, personally, will raise him up at the last day by his own power. And so then, friends, let's press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God. In Christ Jesus, His name we pray. Amen. Amen.